Good morning, church. Let's all stand and worship the Lord this morning. So thankful to see all of you here in the worship center. Thank you for joining us on our live stream. Let's see. Come on. I've got a firm foundation. I rock the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. Come on. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever.
Yeah.
you're never gonna leave, you're never gonna let me down. Y'all sing that with me this morning, come on. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. If y'all believe that, sing it a little bit louder, come on. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me Amen. Amen. Good morning, Landmark Church. Man, so good to be with you guys this morning. I hope you've had a wonderful week. We've already had one great service this morning. I'm excited about what God is going to do in this service as well. Guys, it's St. Patrick's Day. How many of y'all are wearing green? All right, so a few. So let me tell you, first of all, I'm not, but that's okay. You can pinch me if you want to, that's fine. But this morning, let me tell you what I got to do. I got to share the Mobile Leprechaun with my 11-year-old daughter. Okay, and so that's, that's a, what a blessing that is. And now anytime, have you seen the leprechaun say, yeah? yeah. <laughs> the two people said, yeah. I, I was like, am I gonna do that? Yes, I did. And so uh, she knows what to do now when you see the leprechaun, you say, yeah. So anyways, my name's Nathan Caps. Thank you guys for being here today. When you walk through the door this morning, I hope you got a copy of Lifelines. Lots of stuff coming up, things going on, so please pay attention to that as we get into a really great season of our church, as we've got, uh, many of us are going on spring break this week, but we've got Easter coming up soon, and so please pay attention to all the things that are happening with that. Also, you'll see uh, what we lovingly refer to as our connection card, and so if you're visiting with us this morning, first of all, we want to say thank you for being here with us. I know there's a lot of other places you could be, a lot of other things you could be doing, but I believe that you are in a great place with great people. And what we're imperfect people. We're, we're quick to tell you that, uh, but we're people who love God and want to help you and your family get plugged in and grow in the Lord as well. And so please take a moment just to fill this out. You can leave this in the pew. You can also do it the QR code in front of you. But uh, if you have a prayer request, too, we would love to pray for you. It is an honor and privilege, something we take very, very seriously here at our church, to be able to pray for people in whatever season of life you may be this morning. So right now, if you're going through a really difficult time, please let us pray for you. It, it, it really matters. It really makes a difference. And if you're celebrating something, man, please share that with us because sometimes it's just great to say, thank you, God. You're active. You're doing stuff. We want to celebrate along with you. 
So, speaking of celebration, let me tell you something. This past week, we had a great uh, women's gathering on a Saturday morning. This was with Sophie Hudson, and there was about 200 women came together in this place. People from Birmingham, uh, from, I don't know, Huntsville, but, but, but Prattville and Clanton and other places came to be here, and many of you guys joined together as well. It was just a great morning of fellowship and just celebrating God's goodness, and I love it when People in our church get to have an opportunity just to spend some time together and get to know one another a little bit better. Can we celebrate God for doing that last week? It's really a neat thing. And I know there's a, a men's go, a golf outing coming up soon, so please pay attention to that as well. Uh, we are so blessed. We are such a blessed people. This morning we have the opportunity to give back to the Lord. And as we mentioned, it really it doesn't matter what season we're in. We want to proclaim that God is good. As we just saying that he is never going to let us down. And he is good. He is good always. This morning, as we get an opportunity to give back, God is still on his throne. God is still moving in people's lives. He is freeing people from addiction. He is active and among us. And I heard a woo over here. I'm going to tell you, like, you know, a, a woo, woo gets me fired up. But God is, God is active. He's doing stuff. And this morning, as we give, we're not only saying this, that, God, you're good with our words, but we're going to proclaim him with our actions as well as we give to the, together this morning. Let's pray about that. God, we do proclaim your goodness. You have been so good to us, so much better than any of us deserve. You are good. And so, God, we want this offering to go so more people can know that you are good. God, we wanted to go and help people in their, their tough times, Lord. And God, we want to go and proclaim your name with it as well. God, I pray for this offering. Lord, we love you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Jennifer, and we are so excited that you joined us for worship at Landmark. I want to tell you about a few things happening here, so check this out. Currently, the Landmark Youth Ministry is selling Purple Door coffee in the lobby to help raise money for their mission trip this summer. Each bag of coffee costs $20, but when our students sell a bag, they receive $10. Drop by the table today and support our teams. Landmark Men, Sign up today for the March Golf Scramble that will take place Saturday, March 30th at Arrowhead Country Club. You can drop by the Information Center for more information or visit landmark.church slash events to register. Also guys, mark your calendars for the Men's Final Four event on Saturday night, April the 6th at 5 p.m. in the Life Center. Be watching for more information coming soon. The Easter weekend is only two weeks away. On Friday night, March the 29th, there will be a Good Friday worship in the Worship Center at 6.30 to prepare our hearts for Easter morning. Then on Sunday morning, March 31st, we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus at 8.30 and 11. We will be flowering the cross at both of our Sunday morning gatherings, and we're asking everyone to bring flowers for you and your family. It's going to be a special weekend, and we hope Hope that all of you will join us. Thank you again for joining us for worship today and make sure you stay connected throughout the week at landmark.church and on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter, at Landmark MGM. It's so exciting to get up here and see so many of you here on this rainy day. We also are in the middle of a crazy season of spring break. About half of our kids get spring break this week and half next week. So I feel for you guys that got to go to school tomorrow. But just remember next week when you're frolicking around, they'll be back in school, okay? So it's all going to even out by the time we're through. But again, thank you for being here this morning with us. Last week we finished the this it's a must series, and we talked about you got to be ready. And we talked about being able to pray this prayer, Lord, come quickly. And I think for most of us, that's a pretty easy to pray because we are ready for Jesus to come back. But I'm telling you, the one thing that holds me back is I know so many people, and you probably do too, who aren't ready for Jesus to come back. And so here's what I want to challenge you about. In two weeks, we'll be celebrating Easter. And you can see our Easter invitation card up here. This is one of the 
best Sundays to reach out to someone and get them to come to church with you, and they'll get the chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So I pray that you are preparing well for that. This morning, we're going to talk about being in a fog, and we're going to visit what I call the foggiest night in history. Years ago in my life, when I went through a, a pretty serious and deep depression, the word that best described it for me was being in a fog. And, and, and when you're in a fog, you really can't see behind you, you can't see in front of you, you feel overwhelmed, and you feel like you've always been there. It's like if you're driving down the road in your car, and you're trying to get through the fog, and you, you dim your lights, and, and you put your windshield wipers on, and it doesn't do any good. You're stuck. Have you ever been in an airplane where the airplane is landing and it's really, really foggy? And it's scary because sometimes the first time you know you have actually landed is when the wheels touch and it jolts the plane. Being in a fog is a, a very frightening place to be because it's hard to make sense of life in that fog. You've probably been there. Maybe yours is not depression. Maybe you've been in a point of despair a point of great doubt, or life just flat out disappointed you, or you're just discouraged, or you've even faced death. This morning, I invite you to the foggiest night in history. I want you to see, as we begin, a grove of olive trees. There's some large rocks, and if you'll look closely, there's one solitary figure right there in the middle and he's flat on the ground. His face is stained by tears and by dirt. He's pumping his fists on the ground. His eyes are actually full of fear. And is that blood you might just see on his forehead? You see, this is one of the most surprising stories in Scripture. And yet, I think by the time we get through today, you will also find out this is one of the most comforting stories in Scripture, because the man you see beating his fist on the ground is the Son of God. And I guess as I've studied this the last couple of weeks, it's really come clear to me that in this story, we're going to see two parts of this story. And in one part, we're going to see the humanity of Jesus. You might even say the weakness of Jesus. That's shocking, isn't it? And then the second part of the story, you're going to see the divinity of Jesus. So I, I'm going to read from you, and I'm going to read from a, a scripture where the gospels are all put together. So you're not going to be in a turn in your Bible. But I wanted to go, this is by John MacArthur, called One Perfect Life. It's one of those things called the harmony of the gospels. So as we enter Gethsemane and we read about it, you're going to hear every detail of what happened. So focus on the Scripture on the screens this morning. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. What's Gethsemane? Gethsemane is the place where you go when you need to meet God. Jesus quite often went to Gethsemane. That's how Judas can predict where he is. I've been to Gethsemane before. It's a beautiful olive grove. On one side is the there's the Kidron Valley. On one side of it, there's Jerusalem on a mountain. On the other side is the Mount of Olives. And Jesus has come down the Mount of Olives, and he is now in Gethsemane. He said, there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Listen, Jesus takes his three best friends and wants them to be there for him. And look at the description of how Jesus is feeling. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Jesus says, this is, I feel like I'm about to die, is what he's saying. You ever been there in that moment? where it was just the moment was so overwhelming, your heart ached, you felt like it might be the end. And he says to them, stay here and watch with me. Pray that you may not enter temptation. He went a little further, being withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down on the ground, listen. And he fell on his face 
And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, what's that? Daddy, all things are possible for you. If it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to Peter, what, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And not only are Peter, James, and John weak, I would propose to you that Jesus is feeling the weakness of the flesh. Again, a second time, he went and prayed, and he spoke the same word, saying, O oh, Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And when he returned, he found them sleeping again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. They just didn't know what to say. They didn't need to say anything. They just needed to be there for him. He then left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples the third time and said to them, Are you sleeping and resting? It's enough. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Man, what a picture. Now, here's the popular picture that hung over my grandmother's uh, piano in her house. Man, that's, that's a beautiful picture of Jesus. And he's there, hands gently folded, sunlight beaming, a perfect picture of peace. And yet I would tell you, that's not a good picture. But for my grandmother, that was the place that she found peace. My grandmother actually had a pretty, pretty tough life. I loved her dearly. She lost all three of her children before she passed away. And the sad thing was, it was her childhood prayer that she would never outlive a child, that she would, out, she would never outlive the, her children. She had a baby girl died just a few months old. My biological father died when my mother was pregnant with me. He was only 27 years old. And then she had a son die at 50. And we would diagnose her probably with depression at this point. And, and what I'm saying is this was a place for peace for her. But what I really wish is she had had the accurate picture Because if she'd had the picture that we just saw, she would know that Jesus knows what it's like to be in complete despair about life. That's not the right picture. So let's think about this just for a moment. What's Jesus struggling with? Let me just give you a few points here real quickly. First of all, Jesus is in emotional distress. That word used at the beginning of our our reading that Jesus was distressed literally means Jesus, can you imagine this, was terrified. And it's so severe that he thinks it's about to cause his death on the spot. He's exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. And then he's in physical distress. He's got sweat drops of blood. That's a really unusual thing. Doctors know about it. It's called hematodorus. And, and what happens is there is that moment when someone's under such stress that the capillaries in their forehead burst and they begin to bleed. Now, I, I can never tell this story without telling a story of my son, Luke. Um, years ago, we were having a, a prayer meeting out here in the foyer one Wednesday night, and it was pretty intense. And we got in the car. Luke's five or six years old. Now, I'll never forget getting in the car, and Luke, he said, Daddy, I'm ready to be baptized. I said, okay, Luke, why, why do you think you're ready to be baptized? He said, Daddy, back in that prayer meeting, I was laying on the floor, and I was sweating like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said, was there any blood around? <laughs> well, not, not quite. Because can you imagine 
the physical. Today, if you come here and you're physically hurting, Jesus has been there. He's also got relational distress. He needs somebody. He takes three friends. They won't even stay awake. You know, sometimes we think if someone's going through a hard time, i got to be there with just the right words, the magical words, the words that will help them be okay. No, no, you don't. And I don't think Jesus even wanted that from these men. What he wanted was what you would need is presence. He just needs somebody in his worst moment to be there, and nobody's there. And then speaking of that, their spiritual distress What is this cup he keeps talking about? What is this cup he says, I don't want to drink this cup. Because if you read your Bible, you go through the Old Testament, you'll find out over and over, Scripture talks about the cup of God's wrath. What's that? God's anger towards sin. Guys, God is perfect. He can't handle sin. And God's cup is full. Jesus is going to drink to the very bottom all the dregs of our sin. He's going to take upon him. It would be like being at the bottom of the huge Hoover Dam. And behind it's all this pent-up water. And then here you are, and the dam burst, and all that water comes into this one cup, and all the sins of the world come into this one cup, and Jesus dreads what's going to happen to him when the sins come on him. It's going to be so painful. I don't think it's the physical death that Jesus is struggling with so much here, as is the spiritual separation that he's going to have from his father. Now, it's so bad. Just, we've read this story so many times, I think we missed this point. He questioned his father. Because it's not like God just broke it to him that he's going to the cross. He's talked about it over and over again. He, my goodness, has predicted it. His disciples have argued with him about the cross. He knew it was coming. But in the shadow of the cross, Jesus is being overwhelmed by what it means so much that he goes, oh, daddy, 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 please, let's figure out some other way. You know, Scripture says when you ask God, he gives good gifts. This time he didn't get good gifts. Oh, he answered Jesus' prayer, but his answer was no. And guys, when you see this picture, I want you to see this. I think this will help you and help me so much. Jesus is being tempted. And we must say Jesus is weak. He, you, gotta, you don't believe Jesus had this divinity that caused him just to float through earth with no pain and no challenges and no temptation. Scripture says he was tempted in every way as we are. My friends, I need this picture because he can meet me at this picture. He's actually in a weak spot. And here's the good news of the story. When I surrender in prayer, God will either change my circumstance or change me. Oh, great line there. I want you to say that out loud with me, okay? When I surrender, are you with me? Okay, let's try again. When I surrender in prayer, God will either change my circumstance or change me. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes he says no. But he's always working. I love how one author puts it. God sometimes calms the storm, and sometimes God calms me. You see, in the middle of this fog, God is still in control. It's like that plane landing on that foggy night when you can't see the ground. There is a navigation system that God has, and it is going to land successfully. And that's where Jesus finds himself. And here's the good news about that. When Jesus is there, he now can come to us and go, I know what's happening in your life. So I want to illustrate this for you uh, with an interview. I want to ask my brother Brian Bauer to come up and join me. And I, I'm going to tell a little bit, if you guys could bring those stools up about Brian's past, and you can see that it's not going to be easy for Brian to make it up these stairs because of some of the things that have happened to this young man. He's such an inspiration. Many of you know Brian. 
been part of our campus ministry for quite a while. Some of you probably don't know Brian, but I would say to you this morning that, um, man, Brian's been there. And while I was studying for this message, and I saw those four things we just listed, I thought, who in our church could relate to these things? Come on over, Brian. Brian's looking good this morning, isn't he? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. The preacher needs up his game, man. He, um, <laughs> you look great. Um, let me just tell you, let me go through the history quickly so, so you know uh, what this young man's dealt with. In the year 2021, he's a junior in college. He's actually working four jobs at the same time, and he has what the doctor thinks is an ear infection. They give him a lot of antibiotics. I played a big role the whole way through his story. That doesn't work. Then by May, they, they think he's got a deviated septum. By August, they're testing him for mono. And when he goes in for the mono test, the doctor gets really nervous and immediately sends him to the Montgomery Cancer Center. And there he undergoes a test, and they found no cancer. But by September, something's really bad going on. And he's rushed to UAB Hospital where they discover he has leukemia. He does have cancer. And in one of the great blessings, if you talk to Brian Long about this, they allow him to be in a, a new treatment in Children's Hospital, which was a great blessing. And so Brian goes through five rounds of chemo. And uh, by April 1st of 2022, they declare he's in remission. But by just a little bit later, by a few more months, they're back on chemo again. And so by August of 23, he's still been struggling with this, and they decide the last step is to give him a bone marrow transplant. Many of you remember us praying through this. And um, man, it's been quite a journey trying to stay away from the germs and take this and start life all over. Uh, let me just say some good news in the middle of this. Two weeks ago, he had a bone marrow test, and they found out that 100% of his bone marrow is his donor's bone marrow. So that's some good news. <laughs> so if I thought anybody might be able to help us this morning, it'd be Brian. So Brian, in, in the middle of all this, I've told quite a story. I know there's so many more details, but what was your lowest point? Uh, the lowest point for me was when my leg started to get messed up. Okay. I think because of all the antibiotics, all the chemo, something happened. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think Brian will mind me telling you, but at this point, uh, he does not have feeling in his feet. So it's really hard for him to get around. We're praying that this will all be healed. So um, could you tell me this? How close did you come to dying and when was that? Um, there was a point um, when you're going through treatment, they give you like a central line, it's in your chest. Um, it somehow got infected um, with a fungal infection. Um, and so I don't remember the rest of the week, but um, besides my doctor telling me not to go to the ICU, um, but that was the closest I came to passing away. You fought hard, my friend. Now, when I use the word fog to describe this, have you experienced yes, that sir. kind of fog? You can tell a little bit about it. Um, well, the fog is kind of, looking back, I don't remember many specific points. It just kind of all blends together into one thing over like the past couple of years. And so. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's sort of a foggy memory, isn't yes. it, of all the ups and downs. Now, when we've read this story this morning of Jesus in Gethsemane, how do you relate to that? Um, I relate most to when he's uh, begging God to take the cup from him, but if God won't, then let his will be done. You prayed that prayer? Yes, sir. So, I love this story because... What it says to me is God meets us in that fog. He understands. How have you grown closer to Jesus through this experience? Um, he's brought me hope throughout the journey and just reading the Bible and seeing God be there for people throughout the entire 
Bible. I think one of the, the, the most important things you've done is that you have um, you've stayed in the Word of God through this whole time. And that's blessed you and that's strengthened you. Um, and so I, I guess what I love just talking to you, Brian, is you really haven't let this make you bitter. Because when you go through something like this, I mean, I, I can't imagine being a junior in college and full of life and then everything's just completely interrupted. Normally you become bitter or you become better. And I know the leg thing probably is the closest thing to being bitter, you told me. Mm, but, yes. but we've been able to watch God actually strengthen you. And so um, share a special moment where God showed up that you told me about the other day. Um, I was just sitting in my room. I was very, it was very early um, in the process, and I was by myself at this point, and I just felt that sense of comfort and peace come over me, telling me everything was going to be all right through the process. And he, he described it to me as a, as a bright light, and he's all by himself. And, you know, just like this angel showing up for Jesus, I don't know what you believe about that, but I, I, I believe angels still show up. And, Brian, that may just been what you experienced right there. So what I love, man, is that through all this, you've kept your faith, you know? And faith doesn't mean always even agreeing with what God's doing. It, sometimes it just means just you keep on talking to Him, and you don't give up. I know another crucial part of you making it through this has been the people of God. How the people of God supported you? Um, it's been amazing the support I've gotten from just different people in this church, um, the ACA football team that I coached, and just everybody that's helped out. Would you point out two families that have meant an awful lot to you through this? Yes, sir. Uh, the Summers and the Caps have been great help. Throughout. Yeah, it scared me. I knew Michael helped get you dressed for this morning. <laughs> that was a little scary to me. But, but, you know, what I see going through this, Brian, is, um, man, you've kept your faith. And you've experienced this. But because of that, you can draw close to Jesus. And he never has looked at you in the middle of this and said, Brian, I don't get it. I'm in all this is a tough time. I hope you get better. He gets it. And so, guys, I want to use this time to, to lead us into communion right now. And you'll see there's communion stations all around our building. When I was growing up, I used to hear people pray a prayer at the communion table. was, Lord, help us to leave all of our worldly cares behind us and help us to remember what Jesus did. And I would tell you, I disagree with that prayer. I think the invitation at the communion table is not for you to leave the mess of your life out there, but for you to bring it to this table. Because when you come to this table, we come to a Jesus who follows through on his commitment to do the will of God, and he dies for you. And he resurrects to give you life. And so as you come to the table this morning, I want to challenge you, whether you're in a discussion or you're by yourself, to bring the mess of your life to him and let him meet you here and let him do exactly what he's done for Brian, see you through to the other side. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful this morning, God, for this incredible picture of your son, Jesus. We're so thankful for a young man who has lived out this picture in front of us faithfully. And Father, today as we come to communion, we come to you, your son Jesus, and we're so thankful that whatever we bring, whether we're on a mountaintop right now or we're deep in a valley, whether the fog surrounding us doesn't allow us to even see, that you meet us here that your son Jesus gave his body and his blood, that he has been through everything that we experience, including death. So may we meet him here and receive his comfort and strength. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and make our way to tables this morning. And we'll worship together for a little bit.
Please be seated. We're about to read from the, the next scene. And, and I, what I want you to notice as I read this real quickly is the dramatic change that happens in Jesus from that submissive prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane to his boldness, braveness that you see in this moment that follows. He shows his divinity. And immediately while he was speaking, behold, a great multitude with swords and clubs came. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus. For Judas, who betrayed him, talk about hurt, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, it's about 600 troops, and officers from the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and elders of the people came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Now his betrayer had given them a signal. Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he came, immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, the word in the original language here for kiss is not a peck. It's a lingering kiss. Judas wanted them to know this was the one. But Jesus said to him, can you imagine what these words felt like? Friend, friend? Why have you come? Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. Jesus didn't back up. He didn't go behind a tree. He didn't go behind a rock. He moves forward toward his enemies and said to them, whom are you seeking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now, your Bible probably has that word he italicized. There's a meaning to that. We'll talk about it in a minute. And Jesus, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go away, that the saying might be fulfilled which was spoke of those of whom you gave me. I've lost none. Then they came and laid their hands on Jesus and seized him. When those around him saw what was going, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. I love they give the name. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot pray to my Father and he will provide me with 12 legions of angels? You know how many that number is? 72,000. I'm not intimidated by this force or anybody here. If I wanted to choose to get out of this, I could do it with a click of a finger. 72,000 angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Shall I not, here he's ready now, drink the cup which my Father's given me? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who came to him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? This is unnecessary. I sat daily with you teaching the temple, and you didn't try to seize me. But this is your hour the power of darkness. All this was done. The scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. I love that detail. Most people think this is Mark writing about himself. But here's what I want you to see. 
I want you to see in this part the divinity of Jesus. As weak as Jesus was in the garden, he steps forth, and now he is so strong. Just a few points here. He claims to be God. When they ask, are you Jesus of Nazareth? When he says, I am he, the he is not in the original language. We added that. When he really says, and you'll get the significance if you know your Bible, I am. When Moses says, what I tell Pharaoh, tell him I am the great I am. When Jesus said, before Abraham, I am, they wanted to kill him. Why? Because the I am is God. What I am says is I am completely self-sufficient. I am eternally existent. I am and have always been. So he claims to be God. And then when he says that, this is really, to me, sort of hilarious. The soldiers collapse. Can you imagine? With all their weapons and paraphernalia, they collapse to the ground. In two words, I am. And can you imagine the the awkwardness of them getting back up. And so my next point here is even in the middle of this terrible scene, Jesus proves he's God. He said, don't you forget for one second who's really in control here. I wouldn't be here and you wouldn't arrest me if I had not chosen to drink this cup. He said earlier in the Gospels, I lay down my life on my own. And then this is so cool here. Peter gets fired up as always, and, and what does Peter do? Peter flakes Malchus's ear. No, no, Peter missed Malchus's head, don't you think? <laughs> now, Luke adds a detail here, and Luke's the doctor, and, and, and Luke gives a word that doesn't mean the whole ear, he means a part of the ear. I'm almost assuming he cut off his lobe. Now, this is what's so cool to me in this moment. That's just cosmetic. Jesus heals it. Jesus is saying here, the only blood, only blood that's going to be shed is going to be my blood here. Now here's the good news. Just a side note for you. God cares about the small things in your life. I've only noticed this this week. Is the first miracle that Jesus performed was to save the embarrassment of a wedding host when he turned the water into wine. The last miracle Jesus performs before his death is to cosmetically heal an ear so Malchus isn't embarrassed. The first miracle was around people he loved. The second miracle, catch this, was for his enemies. And what I see from this is, guys, there's nothing too small in your life that he doesn't care about it. But here's the point I really want you to get. Because in this story, we see what I think is the most amazing combination, back to back. We see the humanity of Jesus, which says to you and I, he understands what you're going through. And we see the divinity of Jesus, he's powerful enough to help. Oh, I love that. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I can guarantee you he understands. It's like when you go to friends and say, oh, I'm struggling with this, and some say, oh, I hope you get better, or I'll pray for you. But you can look in their eyes, and you know, they don't get it. But when you finally get to that friend who they get it, you go, oh, you can help me. And here's what I'm telling you today. When you go to Jesus, he understands. He gets it. But not only does he get it, unlike me or you, he's got the power to help. The book of Hebrews helps us a great deal with this. Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, because he's been tempted like us, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews chapter 4 says, because Jesus has been tempted in all ways as we are, he can empathize with our weakness. So pray boldly. Hebrews chapter 5 says that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. I've had a hard time with that verse. How was he made perfect? Jesus was morally perfect. That's not the question. Here's what it's saying. Jesus is now functionally perfect. What in the world do you mean, buddy? I mean, because he's been through what you've been through, he knows how to help you. He's never going to shake his head and say, I don't get it, but I love you. No, he gets it, and he wants to help you. And today, I want you to hold those two truths together. He understands, and he wants to help. And I'm guaranteeing there are people here today that you are in this fog and you're struggling. 
And we're going to give you a time this morning to be prayed for individually. So let me invite all those elders, their spouses, staff spouses to surround the stage. Some of them will be in some of the back corners. We need as many of you guys up here as possible. Because I guarantee you, lots of us need some prayers today. And so you can see some that are going toward the back. You can see a couple couples are up here. Jim, if you and Jill would come over here, and Dan, if you guys would come up front too, or if you'd come, it would be great. Now, we're about to sing a song, and guys, this is so simple. If you're new to us, this is one of the most beautiful practices in this church. All you got to do is come up to one of these people and say, here's my name, and here's my struggle. Maybe today you're struggling like Jesus emotionally, physically relationally, or even spiritually, just say it. Or maybe you just, the, the, the word fog just makes sense to you, because right now you just feel in the middle of this fog. Or maybe there's something going on with you that really bothers you, but you, you're prone to discount and go, uh, nobody, no, God's not discounting it. He's going to meet you there. So this morning, man, if you're struggling. You don't have to confess before the whole church. You just come to one of these brothers and sisters and just say, hey, here's where I am, and here's what I need you to pray about. And they will. Because we see from this story, Jesus before this prayer and Jesus after. And there actually may be some of you, it's just time you surrendered. It's time you prayed that prayer. Lord, I tell you what, I've been trying to do it my way, and I'd prefer my way, I think, but the truth is it's not working. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. If you need to come before this church and surrender your life to Jesus and be born again, that can happen today. But let me say to you guys, don't hesitate if you need someone to pray with you before you walk out of here in just a few moments. There's lots of folks that will be honored. And here's the good news. The Jesus we talk to will absolutely understand and absolutely help you because he wants you to get out of Gethsemane and step into victory. So if you need some help, come right now while we stand and sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fight, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, and what
I trust. I trust in God. Come on. My Savior. Who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. My Savior. cut away from what's going on in the worship center just for a moment right now. This is a very intimate moment in our church where we take prayer requests and we pray. Uh, one of the great parts of Landmark, what we think the most unique thing about our DNA is that we have a very open front row. In fact, our members talk a lot about what happens on the front row, that people feel safe to come up there and to to confess a sin or to share a problem or to celebrate a victory. And uh, we want them to be able to do that without that being broadcast everywhere. So I uh, hope that you'll be patient with us as we take a break. But I do want you to know, if, if you're thinking about visiting Landmark, 
that that's something you would experience in our assembly. And for those of you who consistently watch online, we also want you to have that opportunity to be prayed for because we believe in the power of prayer. I've been to too many churches where we just all, all walk in, we all fake it, everybody asks us how we're doing, we say fine, when the truth is we're not fine at all. And so I love being a part of a church where it's a safe place for people to say, I'm not fine. But people to also proclaim, I need you, I need my church. And more than that, I need the power of prayer. And so right now, as we're doing that back in the worship center, you'll see a link on your screen where you too can let us know what's going on in your life so that we can pray for you because we believe that confession and prayer are powerful. So again, thank you for allowing us to take this break. We pray that you'll stay with us until we come back live as we close out this service together. Hand. All right. Hey, church family. We are here right now. Sophie, you are very small for this. Do you want to step up on this step so you don't go under already? Here we go. <laughs> Can you step right there? You feel that step? All right. This is Sophie Oster. <clears throat> she is um, one of our new members here at Landmark. She saw her brother, JJ, get baptized not too long ago. and was really, really excited. And um, Sophie, your dad told me that you want to share your favorite verse today for us. Do you remember what it is? Can you share that with us real quick? Matthew 19, 14. Jesus says, let all the little children come to me. That's precious. Amen. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you that question. Sophie, do you believe that Jesus died and he rose again on the third day and that he's your Lord and Savior? Yes. You do? Well, now I'm going to baptize you. Can you put your hands up? I can touch you. And now baptize you. Can we turn around? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On your way out, grab some Easter invitation cards. We're two weeks away. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the whole church said... <laughs>